I'm at my limit. The beautiful innkeeper looked at me with tear-filled eyes. Her father, the head chef, had collapsed, putting this small inn in a management crisis. Leave it to me. I said, staring into her eyes. I was once the executive chef of a five-star hotel, but now I am just an unemployed man. I never thought I would be serving my food to people again. The familiar feeling made my heart race. My name is John. I am a 39-year-old unemployed bachelor. Currently, I am staying long-term at an inn in a remote mountain area. I had previously suffered a severe burn on my right hand while working. At the time, it was a serious situation, and they said I might never be able to use my hand as before. However, after much treatment, though my fingers and wrist are still a bit stiff, rehabilitation has improved my condition enough for daily life. Sometime after that, I decided to stay long-term at an inn in a hot spring town known for its healing waters. The hot springs here are said to be effective for joint pain and burns, which is why I came for treatment. In fact, it feels like my condition has slightly improved. Originally, I planned to stay for one month, but it has now been extended to over two months. The hot springs are great, of course, but what really makes it comfortable is the atmosphere of this inn. I am staying at an old inn called Cascade Springs Inn. It's run by an elderly owner and his young daughter, along with a few maids, creating a cozy and homey atmosphere. The inn is far from being new and grand, but it's well maintained, and fresh flowers are displayed in the hall every day. The staff are all lively and pleasant to be around. The owner, who is also the head chef, prepares delicate dishes using the bounty of the mountains. His dishes are beautifully crafted, each one a work of art. For long-term guests like me, there is a separate kitchen where we can cook our own meals, and I always used it for my cooking. One evening, as usual, I was preparing dinner in the kitchen. I held the knife in my slightly stiff hand due to the burn after effects and cooked at my own pace. I deftly cleaned the fish, sprinkled it with salt, and fried it in the pan. Next, I thought of making a stew with local mountain vegetables I bought at a farmer's market. Ah, this is nice. Standing in the quiet kitchen, cooking, I felt at peace. I used to be a French chef. After high school, I went to culinary school to learn the basics and hone my skills working part-time at a French restaurant. After graduating from culinary school, I went to Paris alone, thanks to a connection from my part-time jobs owner, and trained at a restaurant for 10 years. In that restaurant, I was recognized as the owner chef's right-hand man, honing my skills daily. Looking back, my 10 years in France were incredibly fulfilling. I managed to balance work and romance, dating a female colleague for a while. However, we eventually parted ways due to differing values and didn't marry. After that, I was headhunted to work in the US and returned home. Through hard work, I got a job at a high-end restaurant in a five-star hotel in New York and became the executive chef at the age of 33. The shouts echoing through the kitchen and the clatter of dishes colliding. The mingling aromas of various ingredients in the heat. That was my chaotic life back then, surrounded by such an atmosphere. That chaotic kitchen life was like a battlefield. I worked desperately from morning till night, and now, reminiscing while cooking, I felt a bit nostalgic. While I was cooking, the young innkeeper, Emily, spoke to me. Oh, it smells wonderful. You really love cooking, don't you? I can tell just by watching you. Emily. She looked stunning in her traditional outfit, with delicate features, embodying the beauty of a classic American woman. Her natural, unpretentious demeanor always made me feel at ease. Most people, when they see the burn scar on my right hand, either react as if they have seen something they shouldn't or go out of their way to show excessive concern. However, she neither averts her eyes from my burn scar nor oversympathizes. I found myself liking her for that. When she peeked into the kitchen, she seemed to want to say something, fidgeting nervously. Is something wrong? I asked. Then, with difficulty, she asked, could you help with preparing tomorrow's dinner at the inn? What happened? Tomorrow, we have an unusually large group of guests, and we're short-handed. She explained that there used to be several employees who assisted with cooking, but due to the pandemic, the number of guests decreased, and they had to cut down on staff, leaving just her father to handle the cooking. I wanted to help, but I hesitated and declined her request, saying, I'm sorry. Even though it was hard for her to ask, she had come to me for help. I wanted to respond to her request, but I wasn't ready to cook for others yet. She smiled and said, don't worry about it. 
I just wanted a bit of extra help, and left. Later, as I was about to head to the hot springs before bed, I heard someone shouting. Dad, Dad, hang in there. It was Emily's voice. I ran toward the sound, wondering what had happened. It was coming from the kitchen, and when I looked in, I saw that Emily's father, George, the head chef, had collapsed. It's okay, it's okay. He was conscious but unable to get up. I immediately called an ambulance with my phone. A few minutes later, the ambulance arrived, and he was taken away. Emily, deeply distressed, accompanied him, crying. The other staff, who had rushed over, looked worried. I was concerned about her and waited in the hall, reading the newspaper until she returned late at night. She walked back, exhausted. Welcome back, Emily. How's George? Oh, John, he's been admitted to the hospital. They'll do more tests soon. She explained the situation weakly. Apparently, George had been unwell for some time. Her request for my help was out of concern for his health. The inn was already struggling financially, but they continued for the sake of the healing guests. We might have to close down. She murmured, tears streaming down her face. To accommodate the current reservations, we'll have to hire a temporary chef. But it won't be possible by tomorrow. So we'll have to ask tomorrow's guests to cancel. Looking down, she said, and I found myself saying firmly. I know I turned you down earlier, but if it's okay, I'll help. What? She looked surprised. My father and I watched you cook in the kitchen and wondered if you were a professional chef, she said. He had apparently told her, I think he's a skilled chef. I began to tell her about my past as a French chef. Being promoted to the top at a young age brought jealousy and skepticism from those around me. That's common in any field, but I believed in my skills and worked hard to prove myself. I treated my young subordinates strictly, hoping they would grow more. However, my intentions weren't well received, leading to a toxic atmosphere in the kitchen, with some becoming mentally ill. One particularly busy day. I got frustrated with a subordinate's clumsy handling of small fish and tried to take over, saying, let me do it. In a panic, he overturned the pan, spilling hot oil on my dominant right hand, causing chaos in the kitchen. I received first aid and rushed to the hospital, but the burn was severe, leaving me with scars and limited movement in my joints. Despite surgery, my hand never fully recovered. Afterward, that subordinate, feeling responsible, said, it's my fault. I don't know how to make it right. And quit the hotel. I also resigned without returning to work. As the executive chef, I could have continued supervising the kitchen without actually cooking. But I felt I had lost the trust of the entire kitchen staff after that incident, along with the jealousy and doubt from others. The reckless nature of my injury, the trouble it caused. And the fact that my strictness had led a young subordinate to quit all of it led to a complete loss of confidence. I felt I could no longer hold a knife in that environment. After resigning, I traveled to various hot springs for treatment. And my aftereffects had improved to the point where they no longer affected my work. However, due to my mental state, I couldn't bring myself to return to my profession and continued to hesitate. I said to her, this inn has been really good to me. I can't fully replace George, but I'll do my best, so please let me help. Given how you can reflect on the past objectively now, I'm sure you'll be fine, John. Thank you. She said, smiling warmly. I went with her to check the kitchen. It seemed George had collapsed after finishing the preparations for breakfast. The typical breakfast he always made could be managed with the ingredients he had prepared, so I was somewhat relieved. However, I didn't know the dinner menu he had planned, and I would need to source the ingredients. I hadn't cooked anything but French cuisine since my days in culinary school. Now, with the unexpected challenge, I desperately thought about what I could do. The next morning, I started preparing breakfast, with Emily helping me. Not knowing where anything was, she supported me from early in the morning. Seeing us, one of the staff teased us with a grin. George always said he wanted Emily to marry a chef, they joked. Hearing that, both Emily and I blushed and fell silent. The breakfast was well received by the guests, and I was relieved. Of course, the ingredients were prepared by George. The real test would be the dinner, with no prior preparations. After the guests checked out around 10 a.m., Emily busily worked with the other staff to clean the rooms and then went to the hospital to check on George. 
Meanwhile, I went to the suppliers she had mentioned to get ingredients. These familiar suppliers advised me on the usual ingredients George would purchase. And I thanked them before returning to the kitchen to start the preparations. While I was working, Emily returned with George. Is he really okay? I thought he would be in the hospital for a while. I was surprised and stopped what I was doing. George, despite being stopped by the doctor and Emily, had forced his way out of the hospital on the condition that he wouldn't work. She pleaded with him to sit in the kitchen, and he said, let me taste it. I was making a fusion of French and local cuisine, unsure if it would suit George's palate. Nervously, I had him taste the sauce for the meat dish. After a taste, he smiled and said, you're no ordinary chef. It turns out George had once aspired to be a French chef. However, when his parents suddenly passed away, he had to take over the inn. With this taste, I can trust you to take over. I'll keep my mouth shut and let you do it your way. Yes. I'll do my best, I replied. He decided he would just sit and watch. I felt grateful as Emily and the other staff took turns helping me during their breaks. What I lacked in the past was this sense of gratitude. Before I knew it, I had forgotten about the aftereffects of my injury and was busy working. I had Emily and George taste the finished dishes. He nodded in satisfaction, saying, hmm, good. It's delicious. I've always wanted to try your cooking. She said, smiling brightly. Soon, it was time for dinner service. Emily and the other staff who were serving the meals and greeting guests kept coming back to tell me how much everyone was enjoying my food. I sighed in relief, phew. As I was taking a moment after serving the final dessert, Emily peeked into the kitchen and asked. I'm sorry, but there's a room that requested to meet today's chef. Could you please go? I'm not the head chef, just a temporary cook. I replied, not really wanting to go, but George said, the guests who ate your food are calling for you. I can't go. You need to. Reluctantly, I followed Emily to the guest room. Inside were two male guests who looked at me in surprise, John? I didn't remember who they were, feeling a bit embarrassed. Uh, well. I stammered. One of them said, sorry, I'm an editor for a gourmet magazine. I interviewed you before. Oh, yes, for the feature on the Five Star Hotel. I finally remembered them. But why is the executive chef of a five-star hotel here, they asked in amazement. I was at a loss for words, ah, uh, well. When Emily, equally surprised, asked. Five-star hotel? What's going on? Emily raised her voice in surprise next to me. They explained they were touring various inns for a feature on Hot Springs. We came here because we heard great things about the head chef and we were disappointed to hear there was a substitute. But the food was fantastic. So we asked to meet the substitute, and it turns out to be you, John. No wonder it was so good. They then eagerly asked, please, let us interview you. I politely declined, saying, I'm sorry, but I'm just a temporary cook for today. Please, reconsider. They were persistent, but I finally managed to excuse myself from the room, saying, I'm really sorry. When I stepped out with Emily, she looked a bit miffed and said, Why didn't you tell me you were the executive chef of a five-star hotel? That's not fair. I hurriedly explained, I wasn't hiding it, it just never came up. But she laughed playfully, I'm just teasing. It shows our taste buds were right. George, who had taken a liking to me, then asked, Why don't you stay and work here? I'm getting old. And this recent health scare made me seriously think about finding a successor. His offer was incredibly generous. I realized that I still wanted to see the faces of people enjoying my cooking, so I decided to work at the inn. George would occasionally help and offer advice on the inn's cuisine. I don't care about five stars or whatever, but remember, I'm your senior in the local cuisine, he said with a smile. He was still lively, and that was reassuring. The two editors kept their promise, and nothing about my situation was published. However, word of mouth spread, and more guests started coming to the inn, having heard I was cooking there. One day, my former subordinate, who had caused the accident, visited with his wife. He now ran a French restaurant with his wife. He had heard about me from the magazine editors. I was worried when I heard you resigned as the executive chef. It's so good to see you again, he said, tearing up. 
I apologized, saying, back then, I was only thinking about myself. I'm really sorry. From being unemployed to returning to a busy life, I sometimes felt mentally exhausted, but I could relax and rejuvenate in the inn's hot springs. It was the ultimate solace. And now, I had someone supporting me. Emily. As I continued working at the inn, we grew closer, often talking about the future of the inn. In discussing the inn's future, we found that our life views and values aligned, and I proposed to her. She accepted, saying, yes, I'd be delighted. We were about to share the news with George, and I was sure he would be happy for us. With a bright future ahead, I mentally prepared myself with a determined all right. 